Good afternoon, everybody. I am ever so glad to have you with me this afternoon. Um, we have got 50 people in the room right now, which is a huge surprise for me. It's a very pleasant surprise. I will be honest. I was um, joking with my head of department this morning that I was preparing to have zero people come to watch. So I'm really glad that there are 50 of you who are giving up some of your lunchtime to come and see me. Um, I think this is us. So we will make a start. I'm going to share my screen with you so that you'll be able to see my PowerPoint presentation and add me. There we go. So my name is Darren Lester. I am a teacher at Wycliffe College in Gloucestershire. We are a an independent school um, with approximately 400 students running from nursery right up to year 13. We're a relatively small school. Um, I say 400, 400 students that I tend to deal with um, at the sites that I teach. And I'm here to talk to you today about how we can use um, COVID learned teaching skills now that we are back in the classroom. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you. I feel like I was a little bit naive when I pitched this talk to, um, to the language show people, because in my head, one of two scenarios was playing out. I felt that either we were going to be back in school and everything was going to be normal and COVID was going to be gone, or I felt that we were um, still going to be on lockdown and this would be a nice... Oh, I'm sorry if you are hearing an echo. I know, I think I know why that is. I think that's because I am uh, attending as a participant. So I will just actually stop pretending as a participant and that should stop. I apologize for that. Um, there we go. As I was saying, um, I was imagining that we would be back in school and everything would be back to normal and we would be saying, um, wasn't that weird? Terms one and two of our year, the spring and the summer. Alternatively, I thought that we would still be locked down and we would be um, still teaching from home and that my seminar, my talk this afternoon would be kind of like a light at the end of the tunnel. A, this is what we can prepare for. This is what we can plan for when we finally get back into the classroom. What I didn't anticipate was this situation we're in now where we've got a lot of hybrid learning going on, where we've got some students who are in class, some students who are not, where we've got some students who uh, or some instances where entire year groups are out of school, perhaps because they're isolating. Um, but I think that my talk perhaps is even more valid now because we are in this hybrid situation where there is an extent to which we are still using the COVID techniques. There is an extent to which we are still um, doing the things that we needed to do during lockdown and we are back in the classroom. So it is very much the best of both worlds now. From my situation, just so as you know a little bit more about me and why I am here. Um, this is my 14th year as a teacher. I trained primary, specializing in MFL and RS. I then, five years uh, after five years as a primary school teacher, I transitioned into secondary where I have been ever since. I currently have a dual role as a language teacher and an MFL assistant. So I do the assistant work for French and German. And I'm very lucky in that I get to teach a range of my languages. This year I am teaching French and German, Mandarin um, and Latin, and then I'm covering, co currently covering some Japanese. So my role gets to be very varied, which has allowed me to use a whole range of different techniques while teaching, because uh, each language to some extent requires something different. So I've been able to try lots of different things, experiment with lots of different things to do with you this afternoon. Uh, my Twitter handle for teacher Twitter is there on the screen. It's at Mr underscore D underscore Lester. I'm giving you that because there will be a link to my presentation, my PowerPoint, which goes out when my talk is finished. Um, I'm sending that, I'm tweeting that because there are some videos in the PowerPoint that I'm not going to show today um, so that I can avoid echoing sound issues, um, but that you might want to watch that you might find useful. So before we get started, I'm aware that I have been talking already for five minutes, um, just about myself. But I want to kind of 
pull back in and to think about what it was like to be an educationist during lockdown because that informs so much of what I'm about to talk to you about it informed so much of my practice um, during lockdown and now so the first thing that I want to do is congratulate you all because we see a lot in the media particularly at the moment um, in England the country has gone back into lockdown However, schools have remained open and the justification for that has been that um, children were losing education and that's going to vary. Your experiences of whether or not that happened may vary depending on where in the country you are. Uh, my Twitter is at uh, Mr underscore D underscore Lester. I will just pop that in the chat for you. There we go. I'm not very active. Uh, my One of my goals for the rest of this half term is to make sure I make more use of it. Um, so as I was saying, we get a lot of bad press, unfortunately, for what we did over lockdown. But the actual statistics are quite encouraging, I feel. So on average, according to um, a report by the IFS, primary and secondary students were each spending approximately five hours per day um, at home learning, which if that's true, and if that is actual sitting down concentrated learning is quite often more than they would do if they were in school. So I find that very, very encouraging. My next statistic is um, predictable. Children from better off families were spending more time at home learning than those from poorer families. So 30% more time. And again, that was one of the, the issues that was raised. And this is something, of course, that now we're back in school, we are dealing with is, is closing that gap, um, particularly between those who could access with the technology and those who could not, which is why the techniques that I'm going to talk to you about can use both. They can be physical and they can be online so that we can help to close that gap so that the, the technology gap doesn't matter anymore. And many parents of both primary and secondary school students were struggling to support home learning. So, my intention this afternoon with many of the things that I'm going to talk to you about is to provide activities that can be set if a student is at home, for example, or can be done in the classroom, both, and that a parent will also be able to access so that they don't feel that they are struggling, so that they don't, they don't have that anxiety that they had before. Uh, those statistics are supported by something I saw in the TES. Uh, this is just on the hours, and the TES published um, the reality of lockdown, the five key findings. And again, 54% of, of students, according to their findings, were spending between three and five hours a day learning at home, which I find really encouraging, I think is brilliant. And well done to everybody who was involved, because we all know how difficult that was, and we all know how difficult that can be. So people have done a lot of research about online teaching. I have a history of online teaching. Um, I have in the past taught GCSE and A-level English language online, exclusively online, to adult learners. So I was going into lockdown with perhaps an advantage over some other people who had not taught online before. Um, I'm not going to play this video for you now. As I said, I will make the PowerPoint available to you on Twitter if you wish to access it later on so that you can watch this. But the ultimate outcome of this video is that online teaching, and so what we need to be taking back into the classroom, involves high touch being more important than high tech, establishing social presence using digital storytelling, using your technology intentionally, utilizing the power of external resources, making your expectations for your learning explicit, fun, play, and the unexpected, regular login, regular contact, and personal feedback. Now, the ones that I've highlighted here in green are the ones that I will be dealing with this afternoon. Uh, the two that I've highlighted in orange are the ones that I might touch on, but that aren't so important for me right now. And to be honest, the two black ones, uh, explicit expectations and regular contact with your students, that's just something that you will be doing as part of your classroom practice now that we are back in school. So I'm not going to touch on those at all. Joanna Dunlap who is the Assistant Director of Teacher Effectiveness at the University of Colorado Center for Faculty Development, said, choose what you want to teach and then add technology. Do not do it the other way around. And for me, that was the, the crux 
of my online learning experience. For me, I was prioritizing my learning criteria. I was prioritizing what I needed to get through for my exam groups, what I needed to teach them to hit their exam goals for my um, my groups lower down the school, it was what do I need to do, what am I supposed to be feeding and what does my scheme of work say. I chose not to deviate from my scheme of work as much as possible um, and I found that, that was very effective. I did find that I could teach exactly what I had planned to teach in class just as effectively, if not more so, from home. Um, I'm going to recognise my bias right now. I loved lockdown. I thought teaching from home was brilliant um, for reasons that I will talk to you a little bit about. Yeah sorry, for reasons that I will talk to you about a little later. But the key to it was saying, yes, we have all this technology. Yes, we need to be using it to show that we can. Yes, this is what our students are using to access our learning. But my lessons come first. And not all technology is going to facilitate all lessons. Not every activity is going to facilitate every lesson. So it's as we were doing before, thinking about your criteria, thinking about what your lesson is for and choosing the activities that are going to facilitate that, that are going to match those criteria. Using technology in language teaching and learning is not new. Um, Levy in 1997 came up with the concept of call, which is still very, very much um, a part of what we do today. And the key components of call are electronic flashcards and they need to be electronic flashcards within call, not just because it's computer assisted, as the um, as the name suggests, but because the electronic flashcards give us spaced repetition. Lots of the research tells us that students will sit perhaps with their physical flashcards or with Quizlet or with Memrise and they will just go through the list and then they'll go through the list and then they'll go through the list and then they will decide that they're done. Under the call spectrum, under the call umbrella, you must use flashcards with a space in between seeing the word and seeing it again, because that's going to be what prompts it. That's your ed memoir. That's going to be what helps you to remember. And again, it's all very well and good us saying to the students, you need to do that with your physical flashcards, but they won't always. So that's where we can bring the technology in. That's where we can use something like an Anki deck, which is essentially an electronic deck of flashcards, which you load up into an app and which you use just like a flashcard. There are no games associated with Anki decks. It's literally just a list of flashcards. And what it will do is it will show you your flashcard and you memorize the word, you do whatever activities you need to do in order to remember it. Then it will take that flashcard away and show you again after a certain amount of time. Memrise, the app that many, many language teachers enjoy, does the same thing. This is where we can use the technology to um, instill in our students what is best practice. This is where we can say to them, I know that you might not leave the space in between because you quite like that you know this word. It makes you feel good that you look at this hiragana in Japanese and you recognize what letter that is but that's not helping you to progress because you're going back over the same things over and over again. Whereas if the technology is controlling the space in between seeing the words, the students are then forced to revisit, particularly the ones that they don't know. I find that Memrise is very, very good for that because it will remember the vocabulary that they have struggled on and it will bring that back more often until they are more fluent with it. Call also uh, encourages us to use multimedia which I will talk about later, and corpora and concordances. Now, uh, Rachel Hawkes last year did a very good chat about corpora and concordances, uh, where she was talking about using a concordance to turn an exam into um, a corpus and to find out the most uh, common vocabulary that came up in the exam to figure out what to teach. So this is where the technology can help us as teachers. You can feed a corpus, you can feed a body of work, such as a past paper, into a concordancer, and it will list for you how many instances of each word exist within, a, within, that, within that body of work, so within that exam paper. You can then look at what the high frequency vocabulary are and focus on those if you need to cut down on time. 
Um, I've got a lovely question from Maria. What about Duolingo? Um, I will be honest, I don't know very much about Duolingo. It's not something I've ever used as a learner. Um, I know that there are varying qualities about it. So the Latin on Duolingo, for example, I do hope I don't have any of the Latin uh, programmers in the audience today. The Latin is not as good as some of the other languages because of the flexibility of Latin word order. So I think with Duolingo, it's nice for um, it's nice for learners and it's nice if you have a teacher to supplement it who can help you through the bits that don't exist. Has something similar been done at primary level, please? Um, for the, the spaced repetition, um, not that is particularly aimed at primary school students, to my knowledge. Um, I will go away and research that for you. But with primary as a teacher, oh, with what Rachel has done with the, the corpus, I'm sorry. No, because um, usually at primary level, there is not an end exam that you are teaching towards. It might be that you've got a scheme of work. You might be doing um, La Jolie Grande, for example, in French, uh, that you can then run through yourself. But there, because there is no end exam, particularly for, for primary level. Yes, no, absolutely. Key vocab is essential. But again, at primary level, where the... Um, where the schemes of work exist, that is something that you would use as your corpus. It's not something that I believe has been done so far, um, although it's a very interesting idea that I like. You're right with retention of phonics. Um, I'm a big advocate of teaching phonics at, uh, at primary level. When I was a primary MFL teacher, my key stage one curriculum was based almost entirely around phonics, so you are correct. I think you are onto something um, Maria, I think it's um, very good. Uh, I really like your questions. Um, however, my, my discussion this afternoon isn't on phonics. Could we perhaps take this uh, on social media a little bit later? And then, yeah. Uh, but I, I really like your questions. I, I would be very interested to chat to you. Um, one of the key things that we found that came up from one of my colleagues, in fact, in a faculty meeting quite recently, was independence with our learners. The independence is something that I think we all find difficult to foster, particularly in languages, because they feel quite insecure about their learning. Because in languages, I think more than any other subject, our learners feel exposed and they feel judged quite often. No matter how nice we are with them, they always worry more about getting things wrong than in any other subject that I've taught. Whereas what I found was, and what we um, at my school in general have found, is that the online learning helped to foster that level of independence. And when I was reflecting on my own practice, I felt that that came because there was a physical barrier between me and my students. I vividly remember not long after moving from primary into secondary, receiving some feedback on uh, in my performance management that said that I was intercepting too soon. Now I thought I was being a very good teacher, I thought I was anticipating problems and getting in there and helping my learners to solve them, but my, uh, my head of department at the time pointed out that what I was doing was providing them with the answers. I wasn't allowing them the time to think. When I've got the physical barrier of the computer in front of me and I'm not necessarily looking at all of my students all of the time, that stopped and I waited for them to come to me and ask a question. So now that I'm back in the classroom, now that I'm back in the classroom, I am making sure that I don't intercept too soon because I've learned that what I thought was good practice by anticipating questions and dealing with them before they became a problem actually was stopping my learners from being independent in the language. And what I've found since, uh, particularly with our year 10 and 11, is that they are now much more um, much more willing to make a mistake, much more willing to try something out before coming to me to ask a question because they've had that experience of, of me not intercepting straight away. I will be honest, in my classroom, I try and do that again by keeping a physical barrier between me and my students. Uh, in one of the classrooms I teach, for example, I have the students sitting in a row behind their desks, then the desks are there as a physical barrier and I'm at the teacher's desk. For social distancing, I don't go near to them. And so I'm not there looking over their shoulder looking at their work, correcting things as they go through. 
So I am able, because I have quite small classes, I'm very fortunate in that regard, I am able to physically foster the independence, I'm able to physically remove myself from the equation and stop myself from intersecting too soon. If you have larger classes, if there isn't that physicality, that physical barrier between you and your students, you can continue to use whatever streaming software, whatever conference song software you were using before in order to create this. Uh, Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom and Zoom all have options for breakout rooms and they all have options for video conferencing, which can continue to be done. They can continue to be done with our students, both in class and out of class. I feel that now, I, I will hold my hands up and say I haven't done this, but I feel that now there will be nothing wrong setting a homework which involves collaborative group work, because I can say to my class, well, we've got a team, so you just get together on Teams with your little group, make sure that you're recording the video so that I can go back and monitor it, that's fine, and then do the group work, write your poem. So again, I'm now able to um, continue, I'm now able to continue with my independence, with getting them to do things with each other and without me by placing the technology um, at the center. The biggest place in which I place technology at the center of my teaching is with my year nine French class, where I have gone paperless. Uh, this was quite a difficult decision for me and it involved lots, a big email exchange between me and my head of department over lockdown um, because I wasn't sure whether this was the right thing to do. But I was thinking that a lot of the activities that I was presenting over lockdown were paperless anyway because I was having to get them to send me work to mark so they couldn't sit there and write in their exercise books. They were having to do things on uh, Microsoft OneNote is what I was using. And I thought, well, why am I going back to using an exercise book other than the fact that that's what I've always done? So I decided not to. Um, what I have done instead is all of our students, all of our year nine students have an iPad as part of their uh, class materials. It's required materials for our school. So I've set them each up a OneNote notebook um, within our class team. And that's where they do all of their work. It's where we record everything that they do. So when we do a listening, for example, they will set up a page and they will write down their listening answers in their OneNote. So there is an extent to which I am using it like an exercise book. There is an extent to which you may be sitting there going, well, isn't that a bit pointless? Because they're going to have to write in their exam. They're writing on their OneNote. So why not just give them a book? The reason that I've chosen not to is because of the extra stuff that I am able to record in their OneNote, because I was determined that I was going to keep this fun stuff going. So what I've been able to do with my year nines is, yes, if they've done some handwritten work and the students who like to write by hand can still do so, I will provide them with paper if they need it, if they feel that they need it, in which case a photograph is taken and that goes into their OneNote. We've done some speaking work in which they recorded themselves on their iPads, that is in their OneNote. It's really hard to record speaking work when students are just writing an exercise book. But now I have evidence of what they produced. Uh, they did some presentations for me on music this week. We've been doing music as our topic. They each had to go and research a French artist. We were able to record those presentations, which are now in their OneNote when they've done the gamified learning sites, when they've done Memrise, when they've done Quizlet, uh, we're doing Vocab Express at the moment, screenshots can be taken, which goes in their OneNote. So last year, they were writing the date and their learning objective and then language lab lesson, and nothing was recorded. But now I've got records of absolutely everything that they are doing. So my one worry, which was that when it comes to a scrutiny of work, um, how am I displaying what my class is doing? I've realized I'm actually displaying more because I am able to display more because I've got the capability now to display more. It also makes marking easier. Marking is something that I think we all have different policies on at the moment. Um, I am taking books in for my classes with books. I know that a lot of schools are not allowing that. But what I'm finding is that, of course, I can mark my year nine work with no worries because it's there on OneNote. I can check when I've had a cover teacher 
I can make sure that they've done everything that I wanted them to do because it's there on one note. I can sit on the train and double check what they've done. I can mark when I've got pockets of time because I'm not having to worry about taking books in and giving them back. Um, so far, I'm, you know, I've only been going since September, but so far it has been a great success and I really hope it continues to be one. We all know what it was to sit and have lots and lots of blank squares um, in front of you. And you were there, you had made sure that you dressed up, you looked smart, you're, you had either a fake background like I've got, or you would put your best books on the bookshelf so that any parent who walked past knew how intelligent you were. Um, but all you had was blank screens in front of you and you didn't see what your class looked like for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And for a lot of people, that was a bad thing. And a lot of people did miss that kind of interaction that they had with the students. But what I found from a speaking point of view is that it was ever so much better because my students weren't embarrassed anymore. Now, I like to think that my students aren't embarrassed with me anyway. I work hard to kind of put them at ease when they come to me for speaking, especially in my role as assistant. Um, and so I like to think that my classes are comfortable speaking to me, but there is always that barrier. And, you know, the children will admit that they find speaking the hardest skill. But over lockdown, curiously, all of my classes from my year eight German all the way up to my year 13 uh, French speaking, they were all much more confident to speak to me because they were a little blank square. I haven't checked this, I've not asked because I don't want to embarrass them, but I think that it was that perceived anonymity that helped them to overcome that. Because they didn't feel they were being watched, because they didn't feel they were being looked at, they didn't feel they were being judged and they were more able to, they were more willing to work to make mistakes. And as we've had in the chat, mistakes are so important. Mistakes are so important in languages. And so I think we need to um, continue to foster that perceived anonymity. I think we need to continue to let them feel like we're not looking at them so that they can speak. And this is most easily done in pair work, I think. Because what you can do is you can set them off. If you do not have one-to-one -one technology in your classroom, you can set them off in pairs and then you can deliberately ignore them. You can do something else. You can do some filing. You could do some marking. You can look like you are not interacting with your students. And all the while you are listening. Obviously, you're listening to make sure that they are on task. But you're also listening to what they are saying, to the language that they are producing. Because if they think you're not listening, they're going to think that you're not judging. They're going to have a go. If you do have one-to-one -one technology like we have, this is another place that you can continue using your, um, your conferencing software. So again, to reference my year nines, for example, I'm quite lucky with how the school is set out because I teach in a classroom on one side of a small corridor. Um, my normal classroom is on the other side of that little corridor. So I could put a student in my empty classroom, a student in the classroom that I'm teaching in, and they could talk to each other over Teams with their little blank squares, and they would feel anonymous. They would feel unjudged. So find a way to keep that going. I think that's a place that we as language teachers can benefit from what teachers in other subjects find quite frustrating. Schools went into lockdown on, or schools closed on Friday. My school started uh, distance learning straight away on Saturday morning. We have lessons on Saturday. Um, and I thought it was gonna be great. I had my PowerPoint set up. It was a year nine RS class. I had my PowerPoint set up. Um, I had my activities ready to go. We went through my PowerPoint, that was great. I said, right guys, now please can you open your books to page 14? And at once half of the class said, oh, sir, I've left my textbook at school. And immediately I knew that for the extent of lockdown, I couldn't do anything from the book. And that scared me a little bit. And I began to reflect on why. Because I remember as a primary school teacher, I didn't use textbooks, particularly not for languages. I, I produced all of my own materials. And I couldn't quite figure out why I had become so reliant on my textbook. I couldn't figure out why I was worried about teaching without it. And I realized it was because of the heavy exam focus that we have, even from year nine. I felt like, I feel like even now, if I'm teaching from the textbook, I'm teaching properly. 
If I'm teaching from the textbook, I'm teaching them what they need for the exam. I'm teaching them what they need to succeed. The textbook is a bit like a crutch for me, like I said, even now. What lockdown taught me to do was to wean myself away from my textbook and to go, OK, yeah, fine. I need to make sure I teach them this section of vocabulary. However, there are better ways to do that than here is my PowerPoint of my vocab. Now please do exercise one, the reading. Now please do exercise two, the listening. Now please do exercise three, the speaking. Now please do exercise four, the writing. Because honestly, that's kind of like what my lessons have become. So I learned to go back to my primary roots and embrace the power of play. I learned to go back and say, it's actually okay that I don't have my textbook. I speak French, I speak Mandarin, so I know what I'm doing. And I think, that's something else that we need to learn as professionals is to retrust ourselves, that we know what we're doing, that the book is good, but it's not the be all and end all. So we're going to have a look at some games that you can do both online and offline. Um, I only have 14 minutes left. My colleagues will not be surprised that I won't finish my presentation today because I can chat for England. Um, but I want to run through some game activities that you can do both online and offline in order to come away from the textbook. You can do these even with GCSE classes because you are still hitting those criteria. You are still teaching that vocabulary or that grammar. You're just doing it in a different way. So educational escape rooms at the moment are all over teacher social media. Um, Scott Nicholson is the professor of game design and development. Uh, in a, at a university in Canada. And he talks about how escape rooms are very, very useful because they put the student in the game. It's not like Memrise and it's not like Fortnite where they are sitting at a device and they are an avatar. With an escape room, they are actually part of the game. They are having to use the language in our case in order to solve the puzzles in order to escape. And because they are doing that, there isn't a barrier. Sometimes I feel like there is a barrier in something like Quizlet, where it's quite passive and they are staring at a screen. Whereas with an escape room, be it online or offline, um, they are immersed and they are having to use the language. Now, I did this quite successfully for an observation a couple of years ago, and this is how I set it out. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time talking to you about this right now. I apologise for that. I now have, know how frustrating it is when a presenter whizzes through their PowerPoint. But essentially, an escape room is a set of puzzles. In our case, it will be either vocabulary or grammar drills that they use for an end. So what I did was I locked chocolate in my safe. I, I have a safe. I took my safe into school and I locked some chocolate bars in there. I had, a, again, a small class of about 10 children. Um, that was locked with a code and the code was written out in French in words and not numerals. So I had to, they had to test that they knew their numbers. Before they could get the code to the safe, they had to unlock a USB key. The code to the USB key was a job. I can't remember which job it was, but it was a job that they had, all of them had failed remembering in their vocabulary test. So they had to look that up. In order to get the USB key, they had to put together a tangram about opinions on different types of work. In order to get the tangram, they had to complete their vocabulary test, a different vocabulary test, with a satisfactory score, which I actually made up so that they felt like they were achieving right from the beginning. They knew that there was chocolate in the safe. They knew that if they got the code, they would eat the chocolate. I was very honest that if they did not get the code, I would eat the chocolate. So they had a physical reward that they were aiming for. They had lots of French that they were practicing by doing these puzzles. They were immersed and they were involved. And it was really, really good, uh, even if I do say so myself. It's a lesson that I look back on fondly um, because of how well my students engaged and because of how well it went. And again, you can do that with year 10. You can do that with year 11. If you're introducing vocabulary, or if you're reinforcing vocabulary, if you would normally sit and do past paper after past paper after past paper, and even you're getting a bit bored with it, introduce something like an escape room just for one lesson, even in primary, absolutely. Because that then will help you to, um, it will help you to be more creative and it will help the children to understand how to use their language more creatively. This is where any illusion that I, 
tell myself that I'm cool disappears out the window because I really like role playing games. I really like RPGs. Um, and I've used them very successfully again in the classroom. In fact, by happenstance this morning, I was talking to one of our year 12 Japanese students about the RPG I did with her French class when they were in year nine. Uh, and she still remembers it. She, she remembers the game. She remembers what she was taught. Um, again, I'm not going to spend too long doing this because I think if you are interested in RPGs, this is something you will pick up. If you're not so much interested or if you know your class is not going to be interested, this will be something that you ignore. But you can bring something like Dungeons and Dragons into your classroom. You can do it in target language. You as the maître de dungeon, you as the dungeon master, can create your story in target language. You get your students speaking to each other in target language. And you get some culture in. Mine is always about Gaulish France, because Gaulish Platonic mythology is kind of my, my favourite subject ever. And so I always set mine in, in Gaulish France, and the idea is that different Britonic gods have been captured and the party has to go and rescue them. And in order to rescue them, they have to learn the passé composé and they have to learn the futur. So they learn a past tense and a future tense and a lot of vocabulary as we go along. And they write a description in French of their character. And that's always a homework that they really enjoy. And then we come in and we just have fun. And I, on a lesson by lesson basis, figure out exactly what I'm feeding them so that they can win. I will warn you, this does not work if you're being observed. Um, I was observed doing this uh, last year or the year before, I don't remember, and it did not go very well. And the reason for that is a role playing game takes time. You're going to want to set aside two or three weeks if you're introducing an RPG into your classroom just for this activity. So if you've got somebody coming to watch you and they're dropping in for one lesson, you might not make the expected progress uh, in that lesson. An outsider might not see the progress that your students are making because of how the, the game rolls, because of the nature of the game. And so that won't go very well from a filling in paperwork point of view. However, if you know that you're not going to be observed for a little while, then this is really good. This is perfect because you can drop in so many different objectives. You can cover so much grammar, so much vocabulary using something like an RPG. If you're interested, I recommend following the, the link to um, Gannon's work on it. It's very extensive. It's a 63 page booklet, but he takes you through very step by step how to set up an RPG in your classroom. Goose Chase is an app and you can use it online that I found quite recently, which sets up a scavenger hunt, a treasure hunt. Uh, yeah, I observed a teacher quite recently doing a treasure hunt with year seven. Uh, using QR codes and that was really really good and the, the children had a lot of fun making it um, and of course because we're in the classroom it was done um, offline they had physical paper maps they had uh, a class set of iPads and they made a QR code and they created a treasure hunt they were doing directions uh, they created a treasure hunt for each other going from one place to another to another to another and they had a great time doing it I would like, when it's safe to roam freely again, to use Goose Chase for something similar. The nice thing about Goose Chase is you put in your directions, so you write them in in target language, or the students write for each other. The students then have to take a photograph of what they've been led to, and they input that into Goose Chase, and you can see it as a teacher, you can control it, and so that tells you whether it's right or not. That then gives the, the students a bit more ownership of it, because they have to make sure they get to exactly the right place. They have to make sure they take exactly the right photograph that you have suggested. So if you've said, go forward, turn left, go straight ahead again, cross the bridge, take a photo of the blue bin, and they follow your directions, but they take a photo of the pink tennis racket, it's wrong, even if they followed your directions. So again, if you are teaching uh, if you're teaching directions, if you're teaching classroom instructions, particularly those of you who teach IGCSE where everything is in target language, then this is a good way to check that students can follow and understand instructions. Again, if you are at primary level, you're not gonna to want to do this one-on-one -on -one, or even in small groups particularly, but if you have a TA in your class, it might be that you send a group out with your TA one week at a time, and they do the scavenger hunt in, in groups of three or four and that then comes back to you.
And of course, what you do is you take screenshots of all of the work, you either import them into OneNote, if you are paperless as I am, or you print them off and they can be stuck into a book, they can be placed into a folder. So you're still evidencing this um, kinesthetic activity that you are doing. Podcasting is probably going to be the last thing I have time to talk to you about today. Um, I'd like to give you a word of warning about podcasting. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by explaining what podcasting is. We've all heard of it. But I think it's quite easy to fall into a trap with podcasting because it's very easy to do a bit like exams do, where let's take a, a, a GCSE writing exam, for example, and it says, OK, uh, you're going to write a, a review. You're going to write a letter. You're going to write an article but they don't actually have to follow the format. So what they're writing is a paragraph. The same thing can be done with podcasting. You can say, right guys, we're gonna create a podcast and it's gonna be great. And then actually all they do is a speaking activity where they say, last weekend, I went to play football with my brother. And all that you've actually done is recorded it. So I suggest that if you're going to use the term podcasting, and please do, because it's a great idea, then create a podcast. Don't just do a recorded speaking activity. Uh, the reason that I say that is because I spoke to some, um, some year six students about this quite recently, and they said that it was cringy when a teacher said that they were going to do podcasting and then it wasn't actually a podcast. They said it made the teacher look like they didn't really know what they were doing. So it's actually quite easy to do a podcast. Each episode of a podcast should be about a topic. So let's say you are with year five and you're doing the present tense. Usually you would only introduce ER verbs in French in the present tense. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm using French as all of my examples today, um, despite the fact that I spent a long time telling you about all of my languages earlier. It's just the one that comes to mind quickest. But what you might do is put your students into groups. You might say, right, that group, perhaps your most able group, please can you write an introduction that explains what the present tense is and how we make the present tense. And they do that and they record it. Then maybe you get another group to take a verb, a regular verb that they conjugate. And then maybe three groups do that. You then have four files that you cut together and you have a podcast that your class has created. You have an episode of year five's French class about the present tense. And that then is a podcast because podcasts are supposed to be informative and they're supposed to be entertaining. And of course, this ticks the nice box that we have about it being better to, um, you learn best by teaching. So you can check how well your students are understanding by getting them to teach a podcast, which then also creates that anonymity. It removes that embarrassment of having to teach their peers. Realia these days is very, very easy to access online. La Redoute, we do a web quest with La Redoute that I can make available to anybody who wants it, where they are um, going out to dinner with the French president. They have a set number of euros to spend and they have to create an outfit. If you liked treasure hunts, but you don't want to send them out, you can do so on Google Maps. This is a treasure hunt that I've created around Tokyo. We start at Tokyo Tower. And then again, we do directions, they follow the directions in Japanese to hopefully my end point. Google Maps can do that very, very easily. The Onati Theatre Company have done a lot of videos online, native speakers speaking at natural speed, so not appropriate for primary, but for higher up, um, that you can use as listening activities, again, both in school and out of school. I really want you to look after your own mental health. I really want you to look after your own mental health. That was the biggest thing that I learned during lockdown. That was my biggest teaching technique that I'm bringing in, is that we are important, we are vital, and we need to be looked after. And we should be doing that to ourselves. I am now out of time. Oops, so I'm just gonna leave you my takeaway. Please don't try and do everything that I have done today. Choose two or three make that part of your teacher brand. I don't like the term teacher brand, but let's be honest, that's what it is. We have these activities that our students associate with us. That's our brand. So take a few of the things that I've said today, try them out and do reinvent the wheel because the axles are broken. We have seen, particularly those of us teaching at secondary, that the system in England doesn't stand up to 
um, a plague. It doesn't stand up to a pandemic. So we have to change. We can't make all of the changes, but we can make some and we can make those changes for the better. I'm so, so grateful for all of you coming to speak to me today. I have to sign out so that we can get ready for some other people, but thank you all so, so much. I hope that it was worth your time. Um, and I hope that I will meet you all at some point in the very near future. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>